Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Sue McCordoff of the town of Osuyus in the province of British Columbia. Sue, welcome to the show. <laughs> I hopefully I pronounced your, your name and the town's name correct because we spent 10 minutes on it. Yes, you did. And thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> um, Sue, I want to start with the question that I've uh, asked every single political person who's ever come on my show. So you're no exception. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from, Sue? Well, let me start with a little bit about me. I have lived in Osuyas for about 50 years, slightly over, and um, I, I spent 35 years teaching elementary school in the local school. So I know several of the kids who have grown up here and now have families. And so that's kind of fun. Because one of our, our new counselors is um, a gentleman that I taught in grade three. So, you know, that's a good thing. It, um, it shows a small community and how we sort of work together. So I, I married and I had two children um, who now are, of course, grown up adults. They live in Vancouver and San Diego. And, um, and so I... Once I retired from teaching, I decided that I was always a volunteer. I volunteered with the Festival Society and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides and um, and just about everything. I was on the hospital board and all of those things. That's kind of what makes, you know, makes it fun. So my next job was, I thought, you know what, I think I'd like to run for town council. So I attended several of the meetings uh, before the election and ran for a counselor. And, um, and there were nine people that, um, that ran for council. We had to choose four and I, was, um, and I was one of them. So I was very happy to do that. And then after three years of being a counselor, um, the mayor who I thought was going to run decided he wasn't going to. And I said, I would like to. And it was kind of a last minute thing. He filled his papers. I filled out my papers. He said at the last minute, I'm not going to run. And so I ran and changed the papers. Um, so this is my third term as being the mayor. So it started in 2014. That's when I became the mayor. But so in 2011, you were elected councillor. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have I have run three times as the mayor and very happy to do it. Um, you know, people say, well, isn't it time for somebody younger? Yes, it very likely is. But right now, <laughs> I think I'm the, the best choice for um, bridging the gap from what's gone on in, in town and, and the past and how we need to learn from that to deal with the uh, ever increasing number of, uh, of things to deal with in the present and, um, and obviously look to the future. So we have on council, we have three, three of us that have been on council before and two new ones. So it's the best combination, I think. So there's a lot to unpack with what you just said, but I want to start yeah. with the, the main mm -hmm. question. You you said that it wasn't until you retired that you decided to get involved in the political realm. Had you been political beforehand? Had you volunteered on campaigns? Or do you just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to get involved in politics. How does your journey get involved into politics after retirement? Or was it there beforehand? And was it discussed at the dinner table? I You know, I think it was. Um, I was um, on the hospital board when we had hospital boards and I was the chair of the hospital board. So that's a kind of, that's a political decision. That was while I was working. Um, and, you know, my husband wasn't quite as involved in things as I was. 
and he died 15 years ago. And my kids said to me, mom, you know, all of the things that you might have wanted to do, but weren't quite in uh, as uh, dad wasn't quite as comfortable, do them. And so I jumped in. So I'm very happy to do that. I've always, I've received several volunteer awards from not only the town, but from the Okanagan Valley, that type of thing. So I was always involved in just about everything. Was municipal politics the only choice for you? You could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen federal, but you chose municipal, the front lines of politics. Was it an easy choice and was it the only choice? I think it is the only choice for me. I think municipal politics is where you get the the strong connection to your voters and to the people that live here. Um, I know that you interviewed James Miller, um, who is uh, who sits on the RDOS, the regional district board with me. And he was he used to say, because he's the editor of the paper, and he would say, well, I think that Sue McCordoff should run for provincial politics. I said, James, I'm not. Quite frankly, I'm happy to be here. Um, I would do have to do a lot of traveling, and um, and that's not really my thing. I'm much better at being involved. I'm still involved with lots of co- of committees here. We're putting on Easter extravaganza in a couple of weeks. Those are the things that um, that I feel are important, and that's why I have maintained uh, the local politics. I want to go back to that first election in 2011, and we always remember the first time seeing your name on a ballot, walking into that ballot box and seeing that name on and putting that X beside your name. What was that experience like for yourself to, after that whole campaign, finally be able to say, okay, X, I've put it into the hands of the voters now? Well, um, I taught the polls at that one, and um, and, you know, I think it was because partly because I was known in the community. People knew me, what I was doing, how involved I was. And I think that that was kind of, they thought, gee, you know, if she can do this and this and this and this, she'd probably be okay at um, at politics. And I had lots of support from my friends and from the community. So I was happy. You seem to know the pulse of the community, you seem to be engaged in your community through your uh, volunteerism. During that first campaign and in sub- in campaign since, have you found the issues that people are talking about at the doors matching up with the issues that are talking about at the council table, or is there a disconnect? Because I think there's a lot of ish, a lot of con- questions right now, and I know I didn't send you this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. How how much of a connection was at the doors compared to what was talking at council in that first election in 2011? Well, it, it was it's a pretty steep learning curve to begin with, you know, when you get elected and um, and you have to figure out what council can do and what your staff can do. And quite frankly, our CAO and our staff are very well educated are, you know, uh, have, um, uh, and they're paid good money to be in those positions. And I'm very happy to talk to them anytime I go into town hall. And I don't live there, that's for sure. I know some areas do, but I don't. Um, I will go in because I live five minutes away whenever necessary, and usually about three times a week. But I always go in and talk to the CAO and and uh, other staff who of course i i know and um and i just want to make sure that i have a pulse on what's going on and if there's something like somebody phoned me um yesterday i tried to phone back today and i would always do that um and they're out so i just said you know i'm busy until this afternoon if you want to phone me back go ahead i think it's important to for me and for council to be involved in not in the day-to-day minuscule things that go on and big things, but to be aware of what it is. And none of us want to be blindsided. We want to make sure that we understand what's going on. So the council table, I mean, we do make, we certainly make decisions and always have, not all of them are um, acceptable to some people because our job is to look at the big picture 
And usually when somebody has a concern, it's about something specific to them. And while we can certainly understand it, um, our job is to is to look broader than that and make sure we make the best decisions for the community. Is that the biggest learning curve that councillors and particularly mayors and newly elected councillors, because in BC in the last uh, municipal election, a large turnover happened, has to yes. rectify? Because when you get elected the first time, you're like, I'm going to go change the world. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to make sure everything's going to be the way that I think it should be. And then you have to realize, oh, no, that's not how it happens. Is that the biggest learning curve you think most people have to overcome? Yes. And the fact that when you go in there, you are not going to change things. This is a group decision and you cannot go in there with a specific issue. And that's happened sometimes. And I remember and I forgot who it was telling me that a counselor in one community um, over in Vancouver Island um, was elected, went to her first council meeting and then thought, what am I doing here? This is not what I want and quit. So, you know, uh, you you it does take some time to um to figure out what you can do what you can't do i just went to a a really good um um you know speaker last week at the regional district office and uh, his name is ellie nina and he's a parliamentarian and he was talking about robert's rules responsible governance all that kind of stuff and those kinds of things are important for us to understand, and I'll, the two new councillors that are on Osuyas, uh Council right now have said, you know what, we're really enjoying this, but my goodness, things take a long time. And they do. You know, you can't do it in a week. You have to make sure you follow the Local Government Act and the Community Charter and that you have um, talked to the people involved in whatever it is that you're dealing with. And so it takes much longer to get things done than people expect and people want. And that's tricky. That's tricky. You you have been elected three times as mayor, one time as councillor. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself that when you go into that council chambers, you're well-informed, educated on the issue, but also prepared to make a different decision than you originally thought because of new opinions that might be heard at that council table or opinions from the public. How much responsibility do you have to be prepared, but not over-prepared where you're cemented in a decision you're already planning on making? I would, I would, I would not say that I like people's um, opinions. I would rather be look at what the rules and regulations are and the information that we get forward to bring on things, not necessarily the opinions of others, because they may not know all the facts when they make their opinion known. But, you know, um, I do go into town hall. Our meetings are on Tuesdays. I go into town hall for sure on the Friday before and pick up my binder, which has everything in it. Now, it's already, it's online as well, but the binder is for the chair, whoever's chairing the meeting. And it has a chair's agenda, which is a little bit more specific, and the regular agenda. And I spend um, a fair amount of time on the weekend um, getting ready, reading over things, making sure I understand what it is. And quite frankly, when things do change, and sometimes they will change at the last minute, and the you know corporate officer will say, well, we've got a new addition to this afternoon's agenda. And so then I have to sort of go back and figure out what does that mean and how does my agenda change? And um, I do rely on the CAO and our corporate officer um, for information. And is this the correct way to do it? And I don't mind doing that. I'm uh, That's not my job to understand all of that. Um, I mean, I try to, but they're the ones that are the experts in that. And so I will say, could you, am I doing this the correct way or is this the correct term for this or whatever? And it works out fairly well. And people realize that, you know, council doesn't have all the answers. We work together. And interesting that um, at this meeting with Ellie Mina last week, he said, and I'm just trying to find it here. He had written T E 
A M on the board, and uh, it all in capital letters. And here it is. Uh, and that meant together, everyone achieves more. And I thought that was a good thing. So um, those are the kinds of things that you know that we look at and we try and and work together because really, working together is. I mean, it's the best thing. I'm also, I ju I'll jump in with this. I'm also the chair of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. Now that is a board that's from Armstrong in the North Okanagan down to Osuyas through the whole Okanagan Valley. And uh, this is my fifth year as being the chair of that. Um, we have the three regional districts, plus we have a lot of expertise, um, somebody from um, from the the um, uh, the OIB or the Penticton or Okanagan Nation Alliance, and we do work together. And together we're better. And um, we're you know one valley, one water. So that is one of my huge issues: is water. Um, and I think it's so important for people to understand where our water comes from, how we can protect our water, and my goodness, if we get my late, you know, my kick, zebra quagga mussels, which we worked a long time on. If we get them in our lakes, we might as well all sell and go home because, you know, go somewhere else because it will, it will really ruin it. And I know that that affects everybody. And it certainly, there are places across Canada that already have that. So, um, so, you know, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. It does <laughs> because it, it follows up on a question that I was going to ask a little bit later, but yeah. I'll ask it now because, um, you're right. The mayor, the chair is supposed to lead the, uh, the council meetings, but there has to be some respect and trust that your administration is going to give you the correct information, but the most accurate information, how much of a role do you put on yourself to make sure that you're educated in the issues that are at hand, but also knowing the fact that you can't be a, a, a scientist on every single issue that's put in front of you. So how much trust and respect do you put on your council, uh, your administration to ensure that they're giving you the best information? So that way at council, your entire council as a team can make the correct decision. Well, we just hired a new CAO um, in who started in August last year and he's terrific. And um, and we're very happy to have him. He's from Alberta. And so, but anyway, he's moved out to BC and that's a good thing. So I have a great deal of trust in him. He has a good background. He understands the issues. And, um, and I also have a great deal of faith in our directors um, who, you know, and they work well together. And, and, it, and it is my responsibility to make sure that I have a good relationship with staff and with our directors. And I think I do, I work at that. And also that I ask questions and all of us on council ask questions. We had some wild things yesterday because we were talking about roads and which roads um, are the most important to sort of to look at and fix in our town. And what would that be based on? Would that be based on tourism activities or, you know, because the people on the street want it? And, you know, um, we that's that's the kind of thing that we spend a fair amount of time and all of us asking questions. What if we did this? How much money have we got in order to do this? What if we don't have enough money and it costs double what you think it's going to? And that happens way too often. We're all fine with that. We get a project ready. We get the reports ready. We've got it all designed and everything. And all of a sudden, the cost goes up. But to be fair, the own, uh, well, I, we have, council has one employee, and that's the CAO. The CAO deals with everybody else. But I think we've made an excellent choice in hiring our CAO. So um, that, that makes me feel that we're on the right track. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with everything we do, but I think that that's important. So I do put a lot of, um, a lot of, um, you know, pressure on myself, I guess, to make sure that I listen to people, 
that I listen to our staff, that I have, I have a little black book. And, um, and when I come into town hall, uh, they will look and say, "Uh Oh, she's got her black book with her. But you know what, that's my way of, of writing down. um, I'll make a list of things, ask about this, what happened to that? Why haven't we heard about this? And that's the way I deal with things. And it keeps me engaged and I'm enjoying it and I have a positive attitude. So I think that helps. Local politics, municipal politics in general is the front line of politics. You don't go off to Victoria. You do not go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community 24 seven, seven days a week. You can't go to the grocery store without being mayor McCordoff. You can't go to the a local restaurant with being the mayor. Have you found a balance after 14 years of being in the job of being able to do your job as mayor, but also just being sued from time to time? Because I can imagine that's probably the most stressful part of it, because I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong here, but a small town mayor does not get paid like a big city mayor, like a Vancouver mayor. So you are not a full time mayor, but your job is full time. How do you find that balance? So basically, you're a volunteer. (laughs) <laughs> uh, half the time. And you know what? I'm used to that because I've been a volunteer all my life. So it was easy. Um, it, You know what? People are usually quite respectful, but I will, it's my job to answer. If somebody has a concern, they phone me as long as they're respectful. And during the past election, there was, you know, some animosity and there were some um difficult questions thrown out and a social media i mean it's um it's we're going to talk about that in two seconds <laughs> um so you know uh but i do try and respond to people and i try to give them the best information that i can and if i don't know i will say please let me find out or i will uh pass it on to one of the directors or our staff to to deal with and they're okay with so that answer? Not, oh yeah. Yeah, they are. They're they're fine with that. And we try again to work together. So I don't mind. I know I've lived here long enough that I know lots of people. Of course, there's new people coming all the time. But um, but you know, having respect for one another and and trying to deal with things in a in a timely manner for sure is uh, is the way to go, I think. You have been mayor and counselor since the rise of the social media phenomenon that is Facebook and Twitter. Um, I can imagine the life of a politician. You want to respond to some of the comments that are posted about your city or about some of the issues that are in front of your city. Um, no. Don't you? You don't. I, I do not go on a Suez Connect or on Facebook and respond uh, because I'm not going to get into um, an argument or a back and forth with somebody who may not have all of the information required and continues to make comments. So um, several of like, even the police said to me one time, because, uh, you know, I, I know them too. They said, you know what, the Freedom Convoy was an example. Okay, so we had some, because we're at the crossroads of Highway 397, we had um, people here and it was, well, there weren't a lot, but they were vocal and they felt they had um, something to say. And um, some of them got quite sort of riled up about it. So they would often say to me, you need to come and support your community and do this. And and a, a lot of the people were not from our community because they sort of all met together here. And uh, and the and the police actually said to me, you know what? Um, if I were you, I would, you don't have to, you're not, rep, you're, you can represent your community without, rep, you know, going to a small town. So I do try and go to things. I attend things. I have to go to the Adam Fiesta on Friday, which I love going to. It's our 49th annual Adam Fiesta hockey in Osuyas. And um, we have one team, I'll just throw this out there, uh, from Quinnell. They have come, Adams are about 12, 13 years old. They have come for 49 years. They've always been there. So we have a huge opening ceremony at the arena. You know, those are the fun things to go to, the things that make people feel good. And we have a, a volunteer appreciation luncheon once a year where we 
honor the volunteers in our town. Um, we have the Festival Society that puts on Christmas light up and Easter extravaganza and a fabulous July 1st, which we've been doing, I don't know, I think 75 years it's been going on in the town. So those are the fun things to be involved with. And those are the feel good things. And then you can, you can deal with people in a positive manner. I want to turn to segment two of the conversation now because I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure we get in yep. this part here. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it because we seem to always get emails about this question. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not opinion of council. This is not a motion of council. This is her opinion. Uh, mayor Sue, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue as of recording this that is facing the town of Osuyus? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you that right after we had the election in October, we knew council and our directors and our CAO. We hired a facilitator and we did a strategic priorities chart. So we looked at all of the things that would be would affect the town and what are all of the things that people ask us about and question. And we spent two days on this. And what we did was come up with council priorities, uh, five main things. And um, and so I'll tell you what those are. Um, Health care, medical professionals, um, we and that's that that's an ongoing thing because of course healthcare in all across Canada and certainly in BC has um has been an issue that you know I personally have been dealing with on various committees for the last 40 years so uh, I think we're getting somewhere we seem to be um connecting more with the uh, doctors and minister of health and that kind of thing water metering so we are that's the second one and actually all water issues but because we have um, um, a problem with our water from our wells, three of them out of six are um, have manganese in them. And when you add chlorine that's required by interior health, it makes the manganese separate out. And so people have brown water. So one of the things that we need to do is have a look at those wells, probably do more and put in a... Um, a water, um, um, you know, uh, what am I thinking of? A, filtration a water, system? Yes, a big, yeah, filtration system, and it's very expensive. And so we're looking at grants, but you know what? Grants are not always possible unless you have water metering. And so, <laughs> you know, one goes with the other. So what we're looking at is if we have put in meters in homes, um, and when they're new builds, we just don't charge them by the water. Yeah, we, they're there. So what we need to do, because we're the only ones in the Okanagan Valley that don't have water meters, universal water meters, and we need to do that partly to have a better handle on how much water we're using, because you can then see that if there's an increase or a decrease in certain spots, then that will trigger some kind of a problem. And also to um, pay fairly. I mean, I live in a property. My next door neighbor lives in a property. They have five people in their house. I have one in mine. So we pay the same based on uh, based on the the lot size. So um, you know, I'm paying way more for my water than somebody else. That's kind of one of the one of the issues. So. We're looking at that, and that's a big push right now to do water metering to make that fairer and to try and get a handle on where we're. So going. right now, right now, residents pay, pay a flat fee. I'm assuming, and it depends where you are because in town they pay uh, they pay a fee. I don't actually live in town. I live in rural Osuyas, which is south of town, so I pay a a, a different part. But yes. That's basically, <laughs> and we've had a lot for many, many years. I was on a boil water advisory because in the summertime, the water would come from the lake and it would be treated and the and interior health would say, well, um, we can't be sure that, you know, somebody isn't going to get sick. And it's, you know, those are the issues that you have to deal with. So 
water. We're doing a water master plan. We have a new campaign, Water Smart Osuyas, where we're looking at all the issues, but they all cost money. And um, so in order to apply for grants, we have to prove that we have done everything such as water metering in order to get the grant. So, you know, it's there's a lot of issues to deal with. Also wastewater. So we are, and I'm jumping right into your third part, tourism, because Osuyas is one of the 14 municipalities in British Columbia that's a resort municipality, right? So um, we have tons of motel um, and resorts here. Um, we used to have a lot of campgrounds and that type of thing. Many of them are being turned into mobile home, you know, areas where people don't camp in tents, they camp in, you know, those kinds of things. And that's caused some concern because people who come here say, I've come, I've come here and camped for, you know, for 40 years with my family and I want to bring my kids here now and my grandkids, that type of thing. So we have a, a huge um, water problem in, and wastewater in the summertime because we can have five times the population here in the summertime if all of the campgrounds and motels are, are being used. In the wintertime, we have a lot of snowbirds that come here from the normally from like Ontario, uh, Manitoba, B, um, Saskatchewan and Alberta. And they come here because they can rent a motel unit for a month, um, two months, three months. And it's a beautiful place to be. So and it's probably more expensive um, to for your your health insurance to go down south. So we do have a use for our motels in the wintertime, too. So it's really important to us to make sure that we look at everybody's looking at it, asset management infrastructure um it's it's so costly that you just have to say okay we need to set aside some money to fix these roads and and check that the that all the pipes are going and make sure that our our water sewage our treatment plant is um it, you know is being built and that our sewage lagoons are cleaned out and um ready to accept the the water from our sewage treatment plant and they, that is then used on the golf course the reclaimed water it's used on our golf course and on our sports really? wow. fields yes good so that is good use of it and actually when i was teaching i used to take my class on the school bus up to the sewage lagoons and we'd get somebody from the town to um sort of take them on a tour and so the sewage would go into two or three different lagoons. And in the last one where it's been sort of purified more, there were ducks swimming. So he always used to say to the kids, you know, the grade two, three, hey, did you bring your, your bathing suit? Because we could all go swimming with the ducks. And they'd all say gross. But you know what? It um, it has worked well for us. And we continue to, to look at that and make sure that we like the water the wastewater master plan and the water master plan are in the works right now because that we feel is probably one of the most important. So you talked about the five issues that there are in the strategic plan. So you talked about healthcare, we, uh, water. What are the other three? Yeah. Uh, one is public engagement. And we, is that a big issue? That, is that really a big yeah. issue? I think so because people are getting a lot of their information on Facebook or on, you know, and we want to make sure that, because not everybody's on there. We want to use TV sometimes, um, the radio. We have a great radio station here that we use. We want to use the newspaper. We want to put up signage in places. We have in town, um, our town website, we have e-news and that goes out to people to sign up. It's free. Um, we we've had we try and get more and more and more people, but not everybody signs up for that, and that gives you information. So we. So I'm going to jump in here for a second because y you've just opened up my my favorite conversation about public engagement. I as a as a former communications person for a municipality, I know you can you can uh, 
advertise until you're blue in the face. There's always going to be that one person that I didn't, I didn't hear about it. I didn't hear it on the radio. I didn't see it on the TV. I didn't see it in the, uh, the post office. I didn't see it on the Facebook page. I didn't see it on the website. How do you engage when, when you have people like that? Well, <laughs> um, we tell them here are the five places that you could find it. Um, and we, and I always encourage people if they've got com a computer to get e-news because that gives you up-to-date information from the town right away. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do. You can't, you can't tell people that they have to pay attention and they have to, to go on e-news or read the paper or something, you know, I think you do your best, but that's why we felt it was important to try and do our best. And our, our council meetings are live broadcast too, and they're also available on the website and people can go back and, and have a look at them. So I think we're, tr we're trying to make sure that we have as many different ways to get information as possible. Okay. So Th thank the you next for that. one, oh, okay, next one is our zoning bylaw and short-term rentals. So that's, <laughs> that's a huge one because being a resort municipality um, and having lots of motels and hotels and so on here that that that's their business um we also get people that are that have short-term rentals in their homes and it's not legal to do that in osuvius unless you rent by the month and and you know it takes away from some of our we hire people to come into town to work and they can't find a place to live because the basement suite they might have rented is being rented out on a daily basis or you know weekly basis so we're at we're in the process of doing um a review we just had three public meetings of different kinds um looking at um, short-term rentals looking at our zoning bylaws about allowing different types of of um, activities in certain zones and our lake zoning bylaw because <laughs> that's another big issue our lake is cross border so we have four jurisdictions on this lake we have the town we have area a rural area um, we have the oib so it's indian band and we have the americans so uh because a third of the of the lake is in the united states and i'm also on the um, international lake series board of control so i'm on that board as well which looks at transboundary waterways uh, with the ijc and we work with the with Canada and the states on that one. So those are big issues that we're looking at. How can we deal with short-term rentals? Um, it takes a lot of our bylaw officer time dealing with them because they have to um, go out and say, you know, I'm sorry, but you cannot, um, you cannot rent this out on a nightly basis. Number one, you haven't gone through interior health. You don't have enough parking for all the people that are there. It's too noisy. Your neighbors are complaining, that type of thing. And I'm sure it's going on everywhere. And the last thing I'll tell you about, and number five, is our mixed housing strategy. <clears throat> and so um, everybody says we need to build more and more houses and we need to help accommodate people. But from my point of view and from our, you know, the town's point of view, we need to make sure that we can service those and that we can provide the water and the sewer and the, um, and, you know, and all of that stuff and the street lights and the, and the roads and the sidewalks and the bike paths and that type of thing, because all of those cost money. So um, when we look at, um, at having um, mixed use housing, we have 500 of them in a town of 5,000 that are on the go right now. Some of them are condos, some of them are duplexes, some of them are a uh, main house with a rentable space in the basement that was built that way. So we're looking at that too. So those are sort of our five priorities that we think are the most important right, to deal with right now. But so, it can change. And yeah, I sorry, understand okay. that. But I wanna, I wanna pick up on this one point here. Out of the yep. five issues you just told me, 25% of them, so the, the very first one you talked about, has nothing to do with municipal politics, has nothing to do with local government, and that is health care. It is not a local issue, but I'm going to say this, it is becoming a local issue, for especially for smaller communities like yours. 
how much of your job as mayor is talking to the provincial government on issues that have nothing to do or control of has no control from the municipal stand uh, standpoint lots so <laughs> at ubcm last year which was in whistler that's in um union union of bc municipalities which was in september the mayor of oliver and i um, went to, and we had a meeting with uh, with Minister Dix, who's the Minister of Health, and and he said, well, there we're coming up with a um, you know with a, a new plan to help doctors, and actually they've done a pretty good job with that. I'll I'll tell you, our our MLA is very much involved. As a matter of fact, he's coming and um, and Minister Ma, who is. Uh, now let me think, and I can't quite remember what her ministry is, but they're coming here next week, so we're having a meeting with them. I, we had a meeting recently with the Minister of Municipal Affairs, um, who came to Asuyas, and we took her out for dinner, and um, and she was quite helpful with things. Um, that's Minister Kane, and you know, we're, we're trying to connect with them as often as we can, to try, we're trying to get the Minister of Highways here um, to talk about some of the roads because we have two highways going through town. And fortunately for us, he used to be the Minister of Education, and um, we and and we almost lost our high school here about five six years ago because they were trying to to um, cut down on on you know tried to use their money wisely and they were going to um, bus all of the people from here up to Oliver. And we fought. It was a huge, um, uh, you know, um, you know, takes a, a community to deal with something. And many, many, many people in this community got involved and we saved our school. Thank heaven. So I said, get the minister who used to be the minister of education because we know him and bring him up here. We'll talk to him because he's now the Minister of Highways. So, you know, we do deal with them. I tend, whenever we go to UBCM, we have meetings with them. Um, we can be on Zoom. That's been a very effective way because Zoom meetings over the last couple of years have been, have meant that we could all be on, a, you know, every month or two. It's lessened now, of course, because we don't use it quite as much. But rather than seeing them in person once a year, we could have a meeting with them and we could all sort of give our two bits worth. And that was a positive for having for having Zoom meetings, I'll tell you for sure. Anyway, we are we have a meeting next week with Minister Ma and MLA um, um, uh, Russell. And actually on Friday this week, talking about health care, I'm going to all of us politicians in the area are going to divisions of family practice, a meeting up there um, to talk about what are the new um, health care issues, how are they affecting us, and what can we do to help. So we're open, we're listening, we're ready to, to, to do this. And somebody said, well, you just go to too many meetings. And I said, well, that's part of my job, so I'm okay with it. You have talked about five major issues that you believe are important of the the town and that council believe in the strategic plan session is important to the town and moving it forward. But if I go talk to 100 people in the town and I ask them that exact same question, they're going to give me some micro issues. They're going to talk about a park. They're going to talk about a pothole. They're going to talk about upgrades to a certain facility or taxes. How do yep. you balance the needs of your community with the needs of moving the city and the town forward? Because I can imagine everyone has their own unique issue that they want to address, and it's the most important issue to them. And you as mayor and council have to take those decisions, bring them together and say, okay, we only have a certain amount of money at budget time. We can't run deficits, so we're going to have to pick whose issues are going to be addressed first compared to next year or the year after. How do you do that? And how do you do that in the Osuyu's? Osuyu's. <laughs> I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right. How do you do that in this Osuyu's uh, standpoint? So we, we're quite open with our meetings that we have and we discuss things and our reports and so on. And people can then, if they choose, listen to it. They can also attend meetings in person. And 
um, and hopefully they will um, understand or at least ask the right questions after listening to the reports. And we can explain in the reports what it is we want, why we're doing it, how much it's going to cost, when we have got want to get this underway. So that that's one of the things that we can do. Um, and, you know, we can't always please everybody, but we're happy to talk to them and explain why their issue is maybe two or three down the list, because this is what we're doing, you know, and we're not, we're going to fix the potholes. And, but we're also going to fix the potholes and put in uh, a bike path and put in a sidewalk and make sure that we've replaced the, um, the, the water lines and the sewer lines underneath that section of road all at the same time. No point digging it all up and then having to dig it up again. So, you know, uh, we do a lot of explaining to people why this is, um, this is important and this is what we have to do first. And you're not, you're not going to solve everybody's problem, but hopefully they can understand what our job is and why we have to do these things in a certain order. And yes, we are listening. And at budget time, we spend a couple of days going through the budget and all of the directors come and say, well, here's the things that I think are important. And we will, you know, question it. But, you know, bottom line is they're, they're the ones that are on the front lines and see our public works. This really is an important issue that we need to deal with now. And this road, um, uh, here's why we think it's, it should be done first. And you know what? It's basically up to council to feel comfortable with that and to deal with it. So you know, it's a it's a combined activity together. We we do it. And as I said, I I'm happy to talk to people, try and explain why, or get somebody else to explain their reasons why. How hard is it to say no to residents when they have an issue that's very important to them? Because as they said, they're, that's what their biggest issue is, and that's what they believe is the biggest issue. But sometimes you, you just can't do it. You, you, their budget constraints, issues with other parts of the city or town might be a bit worse off than their part. Is it hard to say no? It is hard, but you know what? We will really try our best to deal with their issue and, um, and say, well, this is how we're going to deal with it. Might not be today, but this we, we appreciate that, and we always ask people to write to, if they have a concern, to write to info at .ca. and that, when they do that, it goes to all of the directors and all of the, and, and town council, and so we all see the same issues at the same time. Now, you know, if somebody phones me and says, well, my next door neighbor is making too much noise, I say, you know what? I, I appreciate that. I wouldn't want that to happen either. Can you like take a picture? If you got too many, is there parties going on there or whatever? Um, can you write this in an, in an email and send it to a serious.ca because we have a tracking system and we will keep track of all of those things. And then, and we can go back and say, gee, um, here's something that has happened many times at this one place. And so we will, send out a director, send out our, our bylaw officer to go and have a look. I will go and talk to them and see what the issue is. Um, not that I can fix it, but I can likely talk to somebody who can give some more information on it. Now, I am just very cautious of time here, and we're at the 45-minute marks, but I want to turn to segment three because I could probably talk to you about this for the rest of your day, but <laughs> I want to turn to segment three now, and it's my yeah. favorite. Not saying that this interview hasn't been fun, but I love tourism. I love visiting communities. I love yep. uh, spending my economic dollars in Canada instead of somewhere else. And Good. as I've said, if you come on my show, I will be appearing in your community. So I will be visiting a Soyuz later Perfect. on this year. So... uh Sue, in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems in your community that tourists need to see if they visit your community and me? <laughs> well, the first thing you should do is go on Destination Asuyas. That's our tourism marketing arm. And they have just done a fabulous new video um, advertising all the things you can do in Asuyas. 
So that's number one. They're they're terrific. They are right. They have a beautiful big building right at the corner of Highway 3 and 97. Easy to see. It's gorgeous. So um, the one of the things, of course, that we have, I mean, I live on the lake and I'm looking out at it right now and I live in the south end and it's a little, um, um, it's not as deep as the north end. So a lot of the ice is gone, but in front of my house, there's been ice for three months and that's okay. I don't mind it. The sun comes out and, um, and everything looks nice and bright. So we have, but in the summertime, we have the warmest lake in Canada. We also have. Um, Isn't a, that your motto? Isn't that a Soyuz's motto? Like the warmest place in well, Canada? What our motto is Canada's warmest welcome. There and that go. means not only the warmth of our climate and our lake, but the warmth in our hearts. So Aww. it goes double. I know it's schmaltzy, but. Um, I so, love it. Well, uh, <laughs> warmest lake. We also are in a pocket desert here so that's partly why so it's the it's the great northern desert and i mean our community center is called the sonora center it's not really the sonoran desert but it's all part of it that comes up from mexico goes all the way up to Kamloops. so we have a fabulous desert center here actually two of them <clears throat> and um one of them is just north of town it's protecting a lot of the native plants and animals of the desert and um and you know the sagebrush and and all of the normal plants we've got bats and um coyotes in there and snakes and you know and scorpions and the the typical things you would think about in a desert and it's fabulous <laughs> that is a good one to vi to visit and that does the plants and animals. We've also got across the lake, the Inkeny Desert and Cultural Center, which is on OIB land, Osuyas Indian Band land. And they're an amazing group. Um, the, the chief, uh, just then phoned them because he has been the chief of the Osuyas Indian Band for, I think it's 36 years. His name's Clarence Louie. And they have their very much involved in community development and and infrastructure and they have some great ideas and we work well together Oliver Suez and and the Suez Indian Band but their desert center is cultural so they have a snake hotel up there and because there's some snakes that live around in the area and they will bring them in and put well they used to I haven't been there for a while to see it they would color the rattles and they'd put in a little um uh, a little, um, you know, a thing that 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 uh, you can click with your with your computer and, and mouse. Uh, you know, a, not a little mouse, but a, a little chip that they put in, and so that they can follow the snakes and oh, figure out where they're going. Yeah, and oh, wow. it's fascinating. Anyway, they have done an excellent job of putting in this cultural center up there, which has a lot of history about um, the the. Uh, Suez Indian Band, it's well worth seeing. So I always tell people, <clears throat> um, go to the Desert Center and go to the Inkeny Cultural Center, Desert Cultural Center. Both two different sides of the lake and two different um, specific, um, uh, you know, um, things that they, that they have on display. You'll love them both. So if you come, you need to go to those. We also have... Um, well, I mean, there's all kinds of things. We've got uh, Gyro Park, which has a big band shell in it. It's right on the lake. That's where we hold um, Easter and Christmas, and we have fireworks and all that kind of stuff. It's a big park on the lake. And the band shell has, has been, is used well. Um, we have music in the park um, every Friday night in, in uh, July and August. We have... Um, other cultural events during the year that are held down there. And, you know, it's a, a good meeting place for people, plus good swimming down there too. And we've put, well, 10 years ago, we put buoys around to protect the swimming areas so that we don't get boats and things coming in and, um, and bothering them. That's, so we you've painted a very vibrant photo. <laughs> yes. Yes, we have. And we've got lots of um, 
we're doing, um, you know, bike paths and accessibility paths. And we've got, we've got lots of that. And uh, the trails of the Okanagan sort of, we're trying to connect them all even down into the States. So it's a great place to come. Where do you go? Where do you go after a stressful day of meetings or work, or you just need to go decompress? And before you answer, you can't say your own house. You have to say somewhere in the community because everyone want every mayor I speak to wants to say their house. But where do you go after a long day and just decompress within the community? Well, I, well, I do live on the lake, so that <laughs> helps me. And my neighbor across the street has a pool, so I'm good with that. But, you know, I try to go to um, different restaurants, different businesses um, in town. I always attend things when they're at uh, Gyro Park, um, the Banshell and all of the things down there. Um, you know, I will, I'll go for a walk somewhere. We've got lots of great walking paths around here. And I'm not a golfer, so I can't say I do that. But, um, but I like to be involved. So I always look and see what's on this weekend. And um, and what can I attend and enjoy? So I, there isn't one place, a walking. Oh, I'll tell you one of the great things to come to. And we have lots of women that come here. Like they'll come, a group of women, they'll come for a couple of days. They'll stay at a motel. They'll go and have their nails done. They'll go golfing and they'll go to home hardware. And home hardware, in a serious one, best uh, hardware store in Canada a few years back. Uh, Frances uh, Solajuk, who's the owner, um, she was a primary teacher at one point. So, you know, you can imagine what the store looks like. It's a gold mine. It's an absolute gold mine. And we have lots of other places in town, lots of, of small um, stores and shops and restaurants. And we have parks. Um, we've, we've got a little of everything, I think. So it begs the million dollar question, Sue, and this is the question I'm going to end the interview on. What yep. makes the town of a Soyuz such a unique place oh, to live? Oh, Sue, yes. Oh, oh, Sue, oh, yes. Yes. oh Sue, yes. Sorry. Yes. Oh, Sue, yes. Such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Well, for all of the reasons that I've just explained, it's, uh, it's a small town. We have 5,500 people here. Um, we work together. There's lots of things that people can do, lots of things that they can volunteer for, um, lots of places to bike and swim and walk and, um, and, and visit. We're in the middle of a, of a beautiful valley with mountains on both sides. There's lots of places close to us, across the line, down in the States, um, up, and lots of people like to go up to Oliver and Penticton. We have a ski hill close by. We have um, a, a good um, arena where there's, um, you know, people can play hockey. They can take skating lessons. They can, there's dancing studios. You know, we, we've really, I think, got it all. So, <laughs> Is that good enough? I don't know. It's, no, it, it was it, perfect. I've it lived was... here. I continue to live here. <laughs> I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, Sue, from sitting down and talking about yourself and your community. It's always great to sit down with mayors like yourself who are engaged and actually want the best for their communities. So thank you so mm -hmm. much for doing this. Um, it's been an honor. Um, and thank you very much for contacting me. And when you come to Osuyas later in the year, please um, phone me or come into town hall and uh, I'd like to meet you. For sure. So with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and by God, it just helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.